So we've all done that, and now I'm gonna. You might still not be convinced. You might be saying I'm a two by two ANOVA type of person, and I might not need this in any way for my project. And I try and convince you that some of the designs you commonly come, uh, come across might be recast as multi-level uh, designs. So even if you think my project is not really multi-level, it might actually be multi-level type of problem. So you might not have cared this, uh, this much this far because you're not working with children nested in schools. You might just be doing experiments where people already have blocks of some sort and you're only interested in the fixed effects. But it might also be useful for many of the designs you encounter. And we'll look at some of those. And in the following examples, we have subjects. And uh, we have subjects I, uh, ID. And I'll just give you sample codes. We won't, won't run any type of things, but just to show you, this is sort of a design you come across. And this is how it would translate to, uh, to our code. TX is a, is a treatment allocation, so this is a randomized controlled trial or like an experiment where you have a uh, group one and group uh, two in, for example, a between subjects uh, uh, allocation. And uh, we have, uh, it's coded as 0, 1, but you can have more, uh, more conditions. And in this case, you also have a, have a therapist, and, uh, and it's, you can have clustering due to the therapist because people are assigned the same, uh, same therapist. And you can have randomization at the therapist design, or you can ran have randomization at, in this example, at the hospital design. I use hospitals and therapists, but you could also think of it as schools or in classes or experiment, just experiments where you have, exp uh, like you have experiment one and experiment two, for example, and you want to account for the fact that one of them is perhaps a lot nicer to the uh, part uh, participant subjects than the other one, and you want to account for the, the noise they're generating in your data. So one design would be a repeated measures design. So you'd have treatment and control. And in this case, we're not looking at therapists and we just have subjects one, subject two. So many of the designs you have, like repeated measures, anima will be uh, like this, like assign people to either a treatment or a control or experimental and control. And then you have, let's say, three time points in this case, T1, T2, T3. And so actually it's a nested design. So you have, the, uh, you have treatment, you have the subject and for each subject you have three measuring points so it is a multi-level model so you could recast it as a multi-level model now how are we going to write those type of uh, uh, equations so a null model looks like this so if you remember by now that we sort of start out with null models and then we test our models against those null models and a null model would be our y's our outcome variable one for the uh, just an intercept and then a random intercept type uh, model and then data is data that doesn't account for the time component you have in your things. It's just a very basic null model. You can also have a null growth model. Okay, so, for example, you're expecting to see some recovery over time for all the uh, for all the patients regarding of over time cortisol or testosterone goes up or down, and you want to account for that. So that would be growth models. So in this case, we're still not we're still not looking at the manipulation we did, treatment versus control. We're just at a time component. So we have uh, time, which would be T1, T2, uh, T3, and then time nested in subjects and data is data. So that's the same type, so that's a null growth model. So it's just accounting for the fact that over time, patients might become better or worse, or over time, in your examples, testosterone might go up or down, or their response time might go up or down, or whatnot. Yeah, so these are the baseline models, and then we can build more complex models to compare against them. So, here, here we can examine if treatment influences our outcome, and that would be a time times uh, treatment interaction. So Tx stands for, uh, for the treatment, and it's still accounting for the fact that we have multiple measure points from the same, uh, same subjects. Yeah? So it's accounting for the type of growth effect that you would get anyway. Yeah? And so this has a, uh, has a random, uh, random slope for time. You could also build simpler models. Because, for example, it doesn't uh, doesn't fit, you might get convergence errors or some things. So you can drop a random slope and only have a random intercept. So that doesn't account for the fact that patients might be growing over time. It's just saying these data come from the same person, these data come from the same person, these data come from the same person. And you can also uh, drop the, uh, the uh, random intercept and just have a random slope by that type of uh, commands if you care. If you don't care for the shifts up or down, uh, but most of the time you would want this full type of uh, full type of model. Because it's the most complete type of, uh, of uh, model. Yeah. So that's a that's a very basic design which you might encounter. Also, repeated measures, uh, uh, another type of design which might be useful. Again, it's sort of you have to bear in mind that if you only have a few uh, measuring points, it's going to be very difficult to estimate some of these uh, things because 
you only, let's say, I told you it was data hungry, so if you only measure it like say two times, then the best guess for the time effect is gonna be the average and the time won't matter too much now anyway. So for pre-post designs with very few measurements, multi-level models might not be uh, that optimal because it, it, it will just try to average that, but you might still get something out of it. It might still be more powerful, but you might run into problems because you're trying to ask, ask it to do complex estimations with very few data points per participant. So you're trying to estimate all the differences between individuals, the, the data only, uh, you, uh, the model only has like two data points per individual to estimate from. Yeah, and so if you had like five or ten, then obviously we'd do better. And so ideally, you would have several measuring points over time in order to account for the fact that there are idiosyncratic differences between individuals. So not just one or two or three, but five, ten, fifteen measuring points. And also that might be the case, for example, if you're doing reaction time tests. People might be doing many different trials within the block, and then you have lots of data points per individual action. Yeah. Does everybody sort of understand how this design maps on to what you have? Now imagine that we add a level of complexity in which we now have uh, therapists, and now we just do the alloca uh, random allocation. So we have therapists who are doing the treatments, and we have control our therapists. So we're not doing the randomization within therapists. Therapists are either assigned to give the treatments uh, uh, or the control, yeah? So that type of model, which uh, if we wanna test the treatment effect, would amount to this. So we have time, but we also have a therapist effect nested in, uh, in subjects. So we have redrawn our things into a tree level, uh, uh, into a tree level model, yeah? So we now account for the therapist effect, we account for a time effect, and we also account for a subject. But in the previous, uh, in the previous example, a, uh, a therapist could only offer either treatment or control, and so the randomization was uh, uh, was uh, at therapist level. But often you might have this type of design where you have a therapist and it's either doing the uh, control or uh, treatment. So that's a slightly different model. And again, I use therapist here, but you can also think of other type of uh, things like experimenters or other uh, type of things which might influence zero design hospitals. Uh, uh, settings, labs, all sorts of other things. Anything which would cause clustering, that could be think of, thought of as, uh, as therapist. Okay, so here we have therapist, and now the randomization is happening within the therapist. They will either give treatments or control. And what we have here as a uh, as model, rather than the, the slash now, is we have the double point for, again, a nesting type of uh, uh, stru uh, structure. And we also account for the fact that, he, uh, that you have a time times tx effect within each uh, therapist. So, somewhat more uh, equations, but mostly we care about this and the, all this other stuff is to account for the design, the design of the experiment, the design of the structure. So we're hoping that if we're doing this type of models at time times tx, uh, that is significant because that means treatment, uh, oh, uh, uh, treatment allocation over time will go up or down for the outcome variable after accounting for the fact that there would be random growth processes or that would be function of the therapist that some therapists are just better at recovery than, uh, than other uh, things or that they would do better with one uh, treatment compared to the other uh, uh, treatments. So that's a crossed over uh, design. And so we might also uh, hypothesize that therapists are allocated uh, 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 participants that report worse uh, symptoms at treatments uh, will start to have better outcomes. So you might have a case so if people are at the uh, at the bottom, they might all uh, always go up in the sense that they're so uh, so they're so depressed, and so the only way so to speak is, is upwards. Yeah. And so in order to account for that, we would have this type of uh, uh, design. So and that type of model will account for the facts write out all the equations, that will account for the fact that if people start out worse, that there is going to be improvement no matter what. So these are some common designs which you might encounter and might be able to use for your, your anything. So you just use the equations to sort of plug in things and you have to read out more about what it actually means and how. I didn't write all the maths behind it, but all the maths accounts for recasting it into a tree level, multi-level model. Sort of get the points, yeah? So it's just if you come across those designs, uh, they might be useful for you. And so things which we already taught, I might do repeated measures, ANOVA, perhaps you could also think it might be a multi-level type of design. 
or I could try it at least and see what it uh, turns out. Okay, it's also possible. Uh, I got him by this. <laughs> so it's also possible that when a therapist is successful with treatment A, he or she will also be successful with treatment B. So you even account for the fact that you, you have strong differences between therapists and how well they are uh, they are uh, they do, and that's written out uh, here. And so in this case, it's allowing for variance and co uh, so the other models don't really allow for the treatment to co-vary, the effect of the treatment to co-vary with the uh, the effect of the therapist. They just say there can be a treatment thing and there can be a therapist thing, but it doesn't allow for the fact that some uh, some uh, some therapists might get a lot more out of a, a particular treatment because, for example, you're asking them to do gestalt therapy and that's their thing and uh, they don't really care about CBT and so they might be doing a lot better with one versus the other, but they you might also want to account for the fact that some therapists are just better and if they're doing better with ter uh, treatment A, they will also do better with treatment B. And so in order to allow for that, that covariance, you could write out the equation like that. And again, you need a time variable, a treatment variable, and then time within therapists, and then time TX therapists. And that's the most uh, complete uh, model, yeah? And so that's the, the model which uh, is sort of the golden standard, uh, I would say because it counts for all different uh, things. It might be overly complex because, for example, your scenario might not be a case where, uh, where uh, individuals always go down or up, and then a simpler model might be a better better fit to the data. So every case is different. But theoretically, you could think, what is the scenario? What am I predicting? Are people going to go up or down no matter what? Is the treatment going to be dependent on the therapist or not? And then you can pit different models against each other. And you can always compare them by those model fit statistics that I showed you last time. Okay, uh, what if you don't have a normal uh, distribution? So, so far we're working with norm test scores and, uh, and uh, things which are continuous, but sometimes you might have yes and no button press responses. And it's just, again, you've done logistic regression for your assignment before, and it's just we can do that same type of thing in multi-level. So it's just changing, uh, you have a forced choice task, for example, yes, no, or people die or they don't die, or they recover or they don't recover, and so zero, one. And so in that case, it's just changing the family from the family which is now linear to binomial. And again, you have to then bear in mind that the coefficients themselves are not directly interpretable. They're, they're odds ratios, so you have to convert them, because otherwise they're meaningless. They're shifts in the log, uh, in the log it's as we did with the, uh, with the uh, logistic regression. Yeah. So you have to convert them, as you remember, you have to make an odds ratio table to figure out what's going on. And so you can have extensions to uh, to nonlinear models via uh, logits. So there's other uh, ways you can uh, do things. And so this is just, again, an example. And so in this case, you would have whether people uh, remit uh, in cancer as a function of their uh, IL-6 blood, uh, blood response and some other things, and uh, their cancer st uh, stage and the length of stay if uh, stayed in the hospital and so all sorts of other things. And so the only thing which changes here is that now the family at the end is, uh, is uh, binomial. And we've put a G in front of LMER for generalized. And generalized means not just linear, but extending to other families uh, of our distributions. So this will do a zero one distribution, like do people uh, uh, remit into cancer or do they uh, recover? Help my data are not normal, so often you might have things which are not normal. So you could transform, uh, you could transform them. So that's one of the solutions which you might have also known from undergrad. So you can try to make them normal. Some things will never look normal because it's zero one or it's a one two three four five ordinal scale. And so uh, if you're unlucky, you have count data. So you're counting the number of uh, monkeys or the number of fish or the number of uh, responses or button presses, and you only have a count uh, data. Then you use Poisson uh, models. Poisson models, I can't tell, we would have to have a separate lecture on Poisson models, but they handle candidates. For example, if you think of number of children, most of the people would have between zero and, uh, and five, so it's not uh, not very linear. Yeah, so it's, uh, and if you have a big peak, uh, zero, one, now one, and two, and then a long tail. So that type of thing would perhaps fit with a, uh, with a Poisson model. But then you might have over or under dispersion, which is known as your Poisson model isn't predicting very well at certain tails of distribution. So it might be overestimating one end or underestimating another end. And then you can correct that with negative binomial regression. So that's another distribution which then accounts for the fact 
that you might be getting it wrong on certain parts of the curve more than the other uh, parts of the curve. And then, as if you think about the case of children, you also have the problem that there's a lot more zeros than you uh, than you uh, than uh, you expect. And so, what actually happens is that people have started to model what happens in uh, in, uh, in that case, because zeros are a, a special mathematical number. And also, you could think that in some cases, people have started to use more model uh, more more common type of uh, uh, distribution uh, more. Uh, Distributions which better map on to what's actually happening. So if people are having children, for example, they might first have a decision, yes, no, will I have children or not? And then they will have children. So you might have a two-step distribution. So one is a binomial, will I have children, yes or no? And the other one is a count distribution. Once I've decided to have children, I'm going to have uh, uh, three or four or two or one. And so what's happening is that you have a two-decision type of process, and that's known as a uh, you can model those with zero inflated models, but also with hurdle models. Another thing where you can think of is they're quite common in ecology. You might not care about ecology, but if you're trying to predict, for example, uh, hippos and like how many hippos are in, uh, in the environment, you might have one process which determines whether there will be any hippo, yes or no. Another one which determines how many hippo there will be. So there might be certain base requirements, like there has to be water, there has to be temperature, all sorts of other things. And that will determine whether there will be hippos or no hippos. And then another process might govern the abundance of hippos, like how many hippos you get once you have hippos. In order to model all those things into a single distribution, you would, uh, you would need hurdle models, or you would need something to account for the zero one. So another example, more psychological perhaps, is if we think, for example, about money donations. So giving to the poor or giving away money in an experiment. Some people might give away uh, money, uh, might make first a decision, I'm going to give away money, yes or no. And then they're going to donate. Rather than thinking of like a, a zero to a hundred pounds range of like a, as a continuous, they might first make the decision: Am I going to give away money? And then how much am I going to donate? And so many of the processes you might think of as continuous might not actually be continuous in reality because they have this two-step component. First, people are making decision: yes, no, and then they're uh, making allocation or they're putting in uh, effort or stress or some uh, some type of that. Uh, other measure. Yeah? You can also have uh, ordinal uh, responses. So sometimes uh, we treat, often we treat seven point scales and five point scales as being continuous, but sometimes they're not, and sometimes you can't get around it and you just have ordinal data. And they go from for, uh, uh, not at all to very much, and you, you, we put numbers on them from one to five, but actually it is an ordinal uh, score. And you can model those ordinal scores via probit uh, models and sensitive regression models. And again, those are all families you can pick from the GLMR and from other functions. So there are family things, and if you ever come across those things, you can study them and say, it looks like I'm going to need an ordinal response model because, uh, it, uh, because we have an ordinal response going from not a lot to uh, very much, or like from, let's say, uh, once a year to weekly. You can recount everything to a number of days, but it's going to be very, uh, very ordinal. If you're unlucky enough to work with hormones, you can have all sorts of uh, really shaped uh, functions. So look at that, that's not very nice, especially you have, uh, you have a big peak and then you have a long tail and you have to account for the outliers. And so it's gonna be very difficult, even with a uh, Poisson type of function, you might be able to, uh, to get close and try to map onto this, but you're gonna miss the fact that there's a long tail happening and you also wanna capture that long tail and that. Uh, what you can do is you can uh, uh, fit functions like gamma functions or all sorts of other functions, trying to get as close as you can to that distribution. The downside is it won't be very interpretable, it'll be very good at mapping onto this, but in order to understand what's going on, you would have to calculate everything back because those parameters, it will have three or four parameters uh, in exponential transformations. It's gonna be very difficult to estimate what's going on intuitively, as you would have to do with the odds ratios the parameters from that gamma model are very difficult to interpret. You have to calculate the model predictions and see what it does. So if you have word functions, it's tough luck for you. And uh, then you have to look at some other distributions to see if you can map onto that data. So cool stuff which I'm unable to cover and which I would like to uh, talk to you about. Like uh, I didn't talk to you at all about machine learning. And like machine learning is the next big uh, thing in computing science. So basically in that case, we don't care about any model assumptions, we're just trying to predict an outcome. So we're trying to predict who lives or who dies or who buys a product. And we just have the computer basically 
figuring out the statistic process for us. And so that could be very useful sometimes. So in that case, rather than us building a regression model, you just say to the computer, here's all the data, tell me which variables predict the outcome measure, and then it will give you some uh, some numbers. And they might be rubbish, and so you have to learn how to interpret those numbers. But it might be very useful, especially if you have exploratory analysis, and especially also in psychology, where we have measured lots of things, uh, but only uh, have very few participants. It might be quite useful to use these type of models. So that's some of the things I'm working on. Uh, and you can also, even if you're a call type of person, I'll just quickly show you uh, uh, some uh, some things on like uh, text uh, text mining. Let's see if I because uh, R can also do text. So tidy uh, tidy text mining uh, with R, so you can count things. The very basic things is just counting, for example, uh, counting the number of words people use. But you can also do uh, Emotion analysis, you can do all sorts of fancy things. You can map the co occurrence of uh, words. So, if people use one word, what's the probability they're using another word? And so, one example would be, for example, let's see if I can uh, top the model. We often have collections of documents and we like to divide them into natural groups so we can understand them. So, you want to find out clustering in texts. So, you have people doing a focus group or some such things and you want to find out the topics they're talking about. Computers can help. So. Uh, and so it's very difficult, but it's a latent Dirichlet allocation process which does this. And what you can then do is you can uh, look at a big, uh, a big uh, thing. But what you can do, for example, is you can uh, every document is a mixture of topics, every document is a mixture of words, and you can see the overlap between uh, those type of things. So what you can do is you have articles from the associate. Associated press, and you want to, for example, see if topics emerge from that. So it has two uh, two thousand documents, which they are they're looking at. We can uh, use LDA. So you do that. Fitting model is the easy part, and then I'll just scroll it through you. And then uh, so these are all the terms which are, are used with a certain probability. So Aaron, abandon, all those uh, type of uh, different. Uh, Different words with different uh, proper, so 20,000 rows of data. And now you can, uh, so for each single one, it says what's the probability that's generated by topic one, and what's the probability it's generated by topic uh, two. Just saying there must be two topics, two broad topics that we find in the associate press. And we can find then the top term, uh, we can use the top terms used. It's not going to be Aaron, so. And then using deep diary, this is all things you found, you've learned, it's using deep diary to do this. And you can see the, quite clearly that, for example, on the left hand side, person, million, year, new, billion, people, last two, company, mar uh, market, things tying into e economics. Yeah. And the second one, uh, uh, I don't know why, but uh, president, new, government, people, Soviet, Bush, two, year, states, global politics, or, or politics. So, so that's really clever things you can uh, you can do and uh, you can then uh, do further things lots of code you can then uh, have where do they uh, differ based on topic two versus topic one so what is measured in topic one but not topic two so you can see in topic uh, topic one lots of uh, those terms so for example yen mentioned in one topic a lot, but not in another one. So that's, again, pointing to global economy, but not global uh, conflict or global politics. So, so. And so in principle, you can do that for any type of, so here they've done it for the Associated Press, but in principle, you could do that for tweets, you could do that for any type of, uh, of uh, things. So have a, have a look, and so so you can mine, you can compare Twitter, uh, Twitter archives, just as a case study. And so, oh, let's see if we can, uh, just quickly to look it up. So you can get the uh, data and distribution of tweets from somebody. You can see what the data, uh, like how, uh, how many tweets there are from by David and Julia. You can find word frequencies. So often do they use certain, uh, certain words. And you can do uh, stemming. So, because, uh, for example, abandon and abandon should be the same type of uh, stem. 
all sorts of coats, all sorts of coat, and then you can see where they are, where they overlap probably. So both Julia and David, they overlap on, uh, on time. And you can see sort of a degree to which they use the same type of uh, words. We could uh, compare word usage, again via some clever maths. Make some, uh, some nice things. So, what makes a, what makes a, so some words David is more likely to use than Julia. So, OMG, something which uh, Julia uses but not uh, David. So David uses hashtag user two thousand sixteen quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you, that's quite nice. So you can see how uh, different. And so in principle, you could also do that for focus groups or like uh, other things. Uh, once you have transcribed the texts. It's things which can be uh, uh, can be done. Uh, let's see if we uh, it can do uh, word uh, co-occurrences. This is from the NASA database. So if they use one word in a title of their tag, do they also use another word? Again, call of code, and that's quite nice, perhaps. So, so they have uh, NASA has different public access data sets, and they have tags what they what they're about. Uh, you can see, for example, if it's censored, then most likely all these things are tied to projects, and you have a cluster which is uh, quite clearly to do with uh, uh, sensors and controls and systems. And then you have something which is very different on like uh, uh, Brazil uh, Eco uh, IBA, and something to do, for example, with uh, soil and data. So you can see if one topic occurs, does it also occur with the other ones? And that's social network analysis and trying to see if clusters topic together. So even if you're a call type of person, quant is the route to go. No, <laughs> no, it won't give you the same type of richness. So, but uh, it could be useful for some things, and even the uh, even the basic things like uh, 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 you can make word clouds with R, so you can make some basic uh, uh, visual representations of what you've done. Also, okay, so that's one of the cool things which uh, I wanted to show you still. Social network analysis, so you can do, say, uh, I've done some things like that, so citation network analysis. So you can see if people cite researcher A, do they also cite researcher B? All that data is mineable, and all that data is something you can uh, uh, extract and then do in R. And it's fair, well, I can do it, so it's fairly simple, I would say. <laughs> uh, but you could also do think of everything else, which is social network uh, type of thing. So you could think about conversations in focus groups, so if uh, one person talks to another person, so you could see, study all those type of dynamics. I could have an entire separate course on social network analysis and trying to see, uh, study group dynamics and, for example, look it up. I didn't talk to you about Bayesian, uh, Bayesian statistics. You might have heard something in your undergrad about Bayesian statistics, or have you not heard anything about Bayesian statistics? Mm -hmm. So Bayesians don't believe in p-values. That's one of the key, uh, key things. And so Bayesians are slightly different in the sense that they treat your uh, data as a given. Then similar to your bootstrapping uh, type of example, they don't take your original data to then build uh, different samples, but they say this data looks a lot like it comes from a normal distribution. So we're going to simulate 100,000 normal distributions and then compare how your data does to that. And if your data is very different, then we must update our knowledge that it doesn't come from the normal distribution. So it's using a type of simulation approach to see what's going on. I'll see if I can quickly show you an example. It's an app called mills.html. So this is uh, some code which I wrote, and it's in, uh, by now, you should know this is an R markdown type of product. So I, I install a bunch of packages, I do some data cleaning, I exclude some people. So this was about hormones, you can calculate BMI, so apply mutate, you can generate separate data sets for men and women. We create lock testosterone and lock cortisol. We can do some descriptives as you've done as well, so APH style tables. Uh, we can make descriptives for the controls, we can make histograms. So histograms for uh, testosterone and uh, cortisol, and you can see that this is not a very nice distribution, for, uh, but this is uh, men and for women. 
but you should bear in mind that those are uh, are locked. So, uh, so, uh, so for females, you have a very different uh, distribution. So we can make histograms. So you know what a BART is, the balloon analog risk taking task. So it's basically a task which participants do, and it's trying to measure risk sensitivity. So every single time you press the balloon, you get money, but at some point the balloon, at a random point, the balloon will pop. And so you can, uh, if you continue to press, then you're quite risk uh, risk seeking, even when the balloon is quite big. Uh, big. And so it's a measure for uh, basically how many pumps people do before the balloon uh, uh, bursts. And that's taken to be a measure of, of risk taking. And I also have some histograms of that here. We can uh, look at outliers and uh, look at how many outliers we find via some code. And then these are Bayesian regression models. So what we do, without going to too much details, we have four chains each time getting 2,000 samples. And they're making data sets like our data sets from a, a regression distribution. So and we're, uh, uh, this is just a null model, or we just have an intercept. And it's a Gaussian model, and you have to put it in a seed, because uh, you know that we use seeds, for example, to make sure it's replicable. So I put 666, because it's a good number. So. And uh, what we did here is uh, then what it does is it does 2,000 uh, uh, four chains. So it builds four different distributions with four chains. Uh, so we we use some for warm up, so we don't look at that because we might be getting all sorts of uh, of uh, randomization issues. But over a while, we'll stabilize and we'll uh, find some things which we can estimate, and then we can estimate the, the intercepts and like this in this uh, 4,000 distributions. I can show you sort of what it looks like in a bit, and then we can build models for 2D, 4D ratios and all sorts of other things. And we can have a 95 confidence interval for uh, left hand and right hand, and 4,000 uh, uh, 4, of these samples, and then see if that doesn't overlap with zero, then there might be something odd going, uh, going on. So if people ever uh, bug you about uh, sample size, then the nice thing is here you can have your data is given, but you say, here's 10,000 samples. And this, it will, in all those samples, it will look like this. So that's quite amazing, I think. But yeah. So lots of output. I won't go through all of it. I'll just try and show you some pretty graphs. And then lots of output. Lots of models I have to do. Lots of models. So if you think you have a tough life, <laughs> These are all so these are like information criteria, but for Bayesian things. And so we're here we're comparing all the different models that we built, seeing which one has the best possible fit. So lots of models I had to build. So much fun. <laughs> and then what we can do is we can plot the uh, so we found some evidence for interaction. So this is the a cat this is known as a caterpillar plot, and so we find a, a T time a, a testosterone a times cortisol interaction. And here sigma is the sort of uh, error remaining. We have uh, the intercept, and so we can see if it doesn't overlap with zero, then there might be evidence for a significant interaction. And that's a, a caterpillar plot. We can make some uh, some nicer plots. And so what you, you see here is, this is what you want it to look like, <laughs> even though it looks uh, quite messed up. So we have four different chains, and it's doing uh, estimations of the of the value. Uh, and over time, it should uh, peak the entire time. And then what we can do is we can ask those four different models to estimate uh, the t times uh, c interaction. And you can see if there was if one model was really uh, one of the uh, so we have four times two thousand samples. If we're doing very different things and it's all over the place, then we shouldn't get overlapping peaks. So we should find one peak here and one peak there. And so if the chains are converging, then we should get overlapping uh, overlapping peaks. And so this is showing that the, so the density is the, the estimate of the parameter value. And we're getting none of them. Like some of them still slightly go over zero. And you have a little blip out uh, here, but I'm not too worried about that. Uh, but you get a big peak uh, supporting the interaction across four times two thousand uh, samples. So good fun. And then you want to visualize it. So what we did here is we made a uh, a graph with uh, the Bart score and the, and the log TRM, and then we did that for. Cortisol for one uh, for the mean one standard deviation above one standard deviation below, lots of overlap as you can see, but you can see clearly diverging patterns. And then you can also plot it that way, or this way, 
And then I did lots of robustness checks, but I'll stop there because you can then remove all the outliers, see if it stays the same. We can add, because uh, this was testosterone and cortisol from hair, so it could be the hair samples were not measured accurately. So what if we count for the fact that people blow dry their hair or uh, uh, use a different type of shampoo? And so we have codes for all those type of things. So just to show you what is all possible with, uh, with R. So. So that was Bayesian models, and I'll just show you some other things which we can still do. So if you want to find out Bayesian statistics, it's cool, but I don't have time to cover it here because it is hard also. Meta-analysis. So uh, I'm not sure if you ever wanted to conduct a meta-analysis or if you haven't been involved in the meta-analysis. Meta-analysis is where we summarize uh, all the data from, uh, uh, from the uh, literature. And we try to find out, for example, if there is an effect of, let's say, temperature and aggression. I'm not sure if you attended that uh, that talk, but there was a there was a guest speaker using meta analysis to do that. And normally, you would have to buy a package which costs around 1,500 pounds uh, a year in terms of upkeep, CMA, uh, or 1,500 pounds for a license. And so, you could also get it for free with, uh, with ART and you can do that. With so also, you can't do meta analysis in SPSS. So. I'll just show you the metaphor uh, page. So if you ever have to conduct a systematic review or a... Uh, uh, there's, good, uh, there's a good reference page for metaphor. A metaphor can do uh, all sorts of uh, nice things. So you can have different designs. And you can also have different, uh, different plots. So these are just some plots it can do. And most common are, well, let's say, a forest, uh, forest plot. So here you have systematic allocation, random allocation. I think it's for vaccines. And uh, what we care about is whether the diamond sort of shifts uh, to, the, to the left, which would mean uh, uh, improvement or no improvement. So you have uh, vaccinated and control, and you have uh, TB positive, P T I think it's probably tuberculosis. And then you can calculate the odds ratios or the risk ratios uh, based on, on those. And you can have a 95% confidence interval. And then you have some type of uncertainty. And then when you synthesize all the literature, it will show you whether there is an effect or not. So it's very useful uh, to do, in, uh, especially in controversial areas in social psychology or in psychology. It's quite useful uh, to, to do this. You find out all the, uh, all the articles, and then you calculate all the effect sizes. And you do some uh, some nice uh, type of uh, analysis on that. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about that. And statistical simulation, I didn't tell you anything about. Uh, so but you did some bootstrapping, but you can also simulate everything. So you can, what I've done, for example, for a study is I simulated uh, experiments with testosterone and then had a researcher remove the outliers and a researcher who didn't remove the outliers. And then we look at significance levels where people can cheat by removing outliers and not removing outliers. So you can do anything like that, like you want. You can simulate experiments and you can do all sorts of other uh, things. And you can even use R for writing. So you can make an APA style paper from, uh, from, uh, from R. And it will uh, be nice because your analysis would then be in the, uh, in the original paper. It might be, not be nice for your co-authors because there's no track changes documents for words and they get a PDF. But in some cases, you can also get a Word document out of it straight away. So I'll just quickly show you what uh, papaya is. I've only just recently uh, tinkered with it. But papaya is something which combines our markdown and our studio. And it's a package. And we can see. We can have a look at the PDF, which it does. So this looks like an hour. So lots of time when you waste things on, on formatting. Like uh, uh, So it has some defaults already set in. How to use Papaya as an example. So there's a sample R markdown script, as you've used before, which will build this uh, template. And so it will uh, have the author notes. It will have uh, the abstract. Then all the divisions into like uh, formatting, how you can use it, how you can include your data. So that means your data is not stored in a, in a separate document anymore, but everything is in a single document. It also means that if the numbers change, 
all you have to do is press a button and it will do it again. So if your data file underneath changes, you can regenerate your, uh, your paper entirely. With the caveat that packages change or things break, but it's uh, so it will, we've made formatted tables and you can have formatted tables directly put it in, uh, put it in your uh, APF, uh, in, uh, in your PDF via APA table, which you've also used. And so you can uh, also make, make plots like uh, direct uh, in your in your, uh, in your uh, paper. So I'm not saying you should all use this, but perhaps it's worthwhile if you're going to go the long run and do a PhD. Perhaps it's worthwhile investing some time in this because if you, I'm, I regret not doing this earlier because it's time, if, especially if you have to do the same thing over and over for the next 20 years, it's time you'll uh, you'll lose formatting. Okay. Oh, and then one final thing is uh, is apps, and then. We're close to the end. Sorry, it's going to take a little bit longer than I expected. But so R can also build uh, dynamic applications. So you can build uh, uh, apps. So you can have a uh, a table. It can do. Let's see if I can find something else. So with uh, Shiny, you can have, uh, for example, animated maps. So you can have a map from Newcastle and then put everything on, on top. And it's all in our studio. And let's see if I can see. So this one doesn't have the examples. Gallery. So you can have. Uh, Visualizing the Lego Sita database. So you can have the timeline going from 1961 to our uh, things, and then it has all the teams from Lego, all the, uh, all, all the things. It has a number of, uh, of uh, pieces. So that's the database. So it's a dynamic thing. So it's a web page where people can then just look at the entire database themselves. And you can have all the Lego teams you want. But you can also then visualize uh, the data. I'm not sure if it start. So these are the number of uh, sets that existed in Lego, and you can see an exponential uh, type of function. And <coughs> you can hover over every single point and see what uh, what happens. So that's just, and this is all uh, all R. And it's just uh, an application built from uh, from uh, from R. The number of uh, teams. The number of pieces, how, how many pieces there were in 1998. Uh, number of average pieces, number of average pieces by uh, by uh, by team. So <coughs> all sorts of things. So if you have data set with, and you have to visualize it for a client of some sort, you can look into building that and building apps. Okay. If you are hungry for SPSS, you can uh, use R Commander. So R Commander is a, a button clicky uh, thing, and I can see. I'm gonna load. Here it is. So this is our commander, and so if you really, really get desperate and you miss the button uh, pressing thing, this has most of the functions which I've uh, told you about. But you can then uh, just click and let's say I want a one sample t-test, or I want a uh, confidence interval, or I want a graph. But it's a lot more basic. So if you really get desperate, you can fall back on this. And it will print the syntax so you can still learn and see what, uh, what, uh, what goes on there. OK. So running analysis for your projects, that's probably what you care about. Distinguish between exploratory and, and confirmatory uh, analyses. Do use uh, vis visual checks. So the correlation matrices plots, I've shown you how to do those before you do your actual full analysis. So try and find out if there are problems in linearity, problems in the distribution, and try to think of any issues in advance before you actually run the analysis. That will save you a lot of hassle. 
Find a fitting analysis. Most likely will be one that we've covered. It might be that you're very unlucky because you're doing things with hormones, or you're very unlucky and uh, you have a very special design. Uh, and then check the assumptions for the model you're using. And most of the time, I've told you what the assumptions are uh, uh, for the things. And you could also check if it's multi level. Run the analysis, and I would recommend bootstrapping. I've shown you several times how to bootstrap things if you can, because that will make your analysis more robust. And check, if you, if you can, check if different models lead to the same conclusion. So remember with ANABA, we check both the parametric and non-parametric thing to see if we got the same type of uh, uh, conclusion. So often it's good practice to not just use one method, but to triangulate. OK, stuff which I've uh, missed. So this is uh, the Q&A type of thing. So is there anything you feel I should have covered which you haven't covered? So for example, in your projects, or things which you, uh, you missed that you would have liked to hear, hear more about in, uh, in both the section, sessions or in the assignments? Because I had to sort of pick certain things. So some of you might have preferred to hear something about meta-analysis instead of something else. But I think it's better to have structured equation model and multi-level models. And for some things, I've just given you the highlights, and you have to go out and read by yourself to find out more. But you have a feeling that you've missed something in terms of topics or in, topic, uh, or in terms of uh, themes. Now would be the time to tell me. You can also still use the feedback uh, form. Feedback, so complete the feedback form online if you haven't already uh, done so. Uh, what will likely change uh, next year is I'll try and get even more exercises in class. So I think there's quite good correspondence between doing the exercises and getting in, uh, doing the uh, things. Uh, I'll try and make it, but it's quite hard to that they're interactive. So as you've done with the R markdown thing, so you fill in a thing and it says, well done you, and then <laughs> move on to the next thing. But that's a lot of uh, work for me, perhaps. So I think that I might just stick with the thing where you submit the assignments. And you're responsible for checking it yourself. So the, the reason I know some of you might have liked me to sit down with you and go through the code, but it's, first of all, quite quote, uh, time consuming to work on somebody else's code. And part of learning how to do this is figuring out what the errors uh, uh, and the problems are, which, uh, which, uh, which R is showing you. And then reverse engineering what's going wrong. And it could be a package. It could be a named object wrong. And that's how you learn. That's also how I learn. And there's not much benefit to me sitting next to you trying to scan your code uh, in, in that way. Uh, next year, we also have a room blocked in for exercises. I'll see also perhaps if I can get a teaching assistant who would be dropping by to uh, offer some support. But that depends on resources and things. So that she, again, that I wouldn't see he or she as code checking your, uh, your uh, things. But just if you run into really big uh, big problems that you have somebody to ask some questions to, uh, rather than having everything go via Blackboard. But again, for all the uh, all the assignments, it would have to go via Blackboard because it's uh, it's the most transparent way for everybody. Uh, any feedback or points you want to raise? So I know we covered a lot in 10, 11 weeks, and it was quite daunting and uh, uh, sleepless nights for uh, some of you. But I think this will prepare. So. The good thing is in the second semester you'll have Python, and some of the things from R are different than from Python. But you should be now slightly less afraid of uh, working with code and interacting with code and understanding what's going on. So, so that's also the rationale for shifting it from uh, SPSS, what it was before, to, uh, to, uh, to R. Anything you want to raise on how it went or uh, just you can also use a form, or you can feed it back to, uh, to your uh, teachers. Or uh, if there's anything, I'm open for criticism and open for things to uh, improve for the next thing. I know it's uh, quite a challenging course, but this is the level I think we want from our research master students. And it's just, uh, I think it will train you better if you go out for a job outside in the real world, and also if you apply for PhD positions. So marks, still a lot to play for. <laughs> Feedback if I turn it in, you can post uh, uh, questions via, uh, that should not be the book, but it should be Blackboard, sorry, and uh, uh, via Blackboard, and you can book an appointment with me, and then that link will tell you when I'm available, so I try to, uh, I won't have continuously hours waiting to run in because I have other meetings and things like that, so just if you go here, please work, yeah, so this is a calendar where I will plot uh, things for when I'm available, and uh, then you email me. You can't book in that because that would lead to all sorts of problems with students booking at the same time. But then you can email me, Thomas. I would like a uh, 3 p.m. slot, and most slots are half an hour. 
and then you just book an appointment with me. And I'll try to make sure, as you can see, there's always uh, 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 today not because I have some other meetings, but throughout the week there's always uh, uh, slots available. And if it really doesn't work out for you, just let me know, and I'll uh, try and find something uh, for you. Okay, and if you have questions on the assignment, use uh, use uh, use uh, use, uh, use Blackboard, and I'll be unavailable between December twenty second and uh, January fifth. And if you're really smart, you can calculate how much marks you should still get in order to. Uh, uh, to avoid this, and then there is no exercise this week, no set exercise, other for the fact that I want you to explore an R package which we haven't used, work through a vignette, and try to see what it, what it does. So there is a, it's up to you if you upload it or not. I'll make a, a thing, uh, but it's just sort of trying. I've shown you some other uh, of the other things which R can do, and uh, if you have no inspiration, then look through R bloggers or Data Camp. Look at the vignette, look at some example codes, and try it on some data as you've done in class. So pick a data set. We've used different data sets and tried to see what it uh, does and try to see if you have errors, what it means. Yeah. So and uh, and write it up in a small HTML notebook as you've done before. And that's for the references and that's all I have to cover. So it's done slightly earlier today. Unless you have questions. What happens if you fail? <laughs> <laughs> like, do you have to reset in summer? Because what if just yeah. said? No, we just said that did happen. And you failed the like assignment one, but then you did okay on assignment two. So you can compensate. So, that, so, so you could create, fail. So, so, you, <laughs> so you can fail assignment one and do well on assignment two, and you won't have to reset. So yeah, you so fail an aspect of the module, like part of the module. Yes. So it will overall. be average. So suppose you have thirty on assignment one and you get seventy on uh, assignment uh, two, then you have a, a pass mark of uh, fifty. Yeah. And I think you only need what's the, the third? I think it's forty-four or forty-eight. I think fifty. Fifty. Uh, yeah, fifty. Yeah, I think it might be different for the undergrad and for the uh, so you need fifty uh, to pass. But I think uh, the, the, no stage, uh, So you could also, as far as I can tell from Michael, but you should check with him, is you can fill a module and still get down the the, uh, the degree. So uh, so I think uh, so you need to fill more than one module. I think for you to fill entirely. So, uh, Right. So uh, I think you can check with Michael, but I don't know what the what I only know that from mine it compensates, and so yeah. and I won't use uh, so I'll just average, and so you might have something with a with a decimal, and then the other decimal, and then uh, it will be averaged. So uh, so you'll get a mark for this one. You'll get a mark out of uh, out of a hundred, and then uh, the other one you also get a mark out of a hundred, and then just average. Uh, so there's still all to play for in the setup. If you get a hundred on the uh, uh, on the second assignment, then no matter what you've done in the first assignment, you would have uh, passed. <coughs> Not going to happen. <laughs> but e even for the ones who didn't do very well in that, I think like it, uh, there's marks to be had for like really tiny things. So I think you can uh, quite easily compensate to get your pass mark. And then even then, I don't think you, you need a pass mark to pass the degree. So. We'll just look back. That's the only one. There's hope. There's hope. There's definitely light at the end of the tunnel. Could be a train. <laughs> You're just ignoring the errors, Francis. Yeah, I'm the same as you. There's not as many errors, but I don't know whether it's right. Like I'm, I'm getting something out of it. I don't know whether I'm putting things in the right place. But you'll learn via doing, and then uh, so so this this is it, and so uh, uh, emotional. <laughs> yeah, emotional for the five of you. <laughs> <laughs>